Okay, everybody, I think we're going to get started. We've had people signing on and some, uh, I know people will still be signing on and plus this is recorded so people will be able to see it uh, later on as well. But I want to thank all of you for getting on tonight. And before we start, if you are staying on for the Narcan training, we do have to have your name so that you can pick up your free kit. Uh, please change your Zoom name to your full name or type your name privately in the chat for us. And if you have a question at any point, you can type it into the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll address them at the end of the program. Um, as we know, the pandemic has hit us, all of us hard, but I know this time and the need to self-isolate can be especially difficult for anyone who may be struggling with any kind of addiction. It's not easy in the best of times, and the stress, the isolation, the additional barriers to help make it really hard. And everyone here today is here to make sure our neighbors know that help is always available. And I think more importantly, no matter what you're going through, recovery is possible. And we want you to walk away from this event feeling hopeful. Um, you know, I met uh, Kelly uh, at Unshattered and a, a few years ago. And let me tell you, that was the best experience um, when I stopped into the shop and um, having uh, Amanda speak at our women's networking event and telling her story, there was not a sound in that room. It was so compelling. And all of the stories and the paths that you, the women take, the, success of the successes that they've had, uh, that's why I wanted to do this tonight. I thought it would be really helpful to have a candid conversation with others who have experienced these challenges themselves. I think that's so important. And uh, so, and I just have to say that Kelly is an amazing person. Uh, I love her story. I always have. It touched my heart from day one, Kelly, of meeting you. And um, just, uh, I can't wait. I keep watching you and watching the women that are with you uh, just grow and do so much good. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the founder and CEO of Unshattered, Kelly Lingard. Okay, Kelly. Thank you so much, Senator Serino, for having us. It's truly an honor to be here. You are such an asset to our community and you serve so well, particularly women in so many ways. So thank you for being a good neighbor and a good friend and a good uh, encourager of Unshattered. So I'm Kelly Lingard and I was previously an executive here with IBM in the Hudson Valley. Never thought that I would leave that career <clears throat> until I actually heard the story of a woman in recovery here locally. And she shared her journey of addiction and recovery, having been eight years old the first time that she started using. Emily was from a broken home. Uh, she had a mom that was ill and bed a lot, and she had a brother. And at eight years old, she was taking care of all of them. She had a friend that was 15 years old that thought it would be funny to get an eight-year-old high. Fast forward a few years, and she was a homeless IV addict. And it just blew me away to understand the pain behind the stories of addiction, uh, how young people are when they started using, but most importantly, how difficult it is to unwind that. Once somebody wants to get well and they pursue sobriety, that journey in and of itself is really difficult. I personally got involved with a local recovery program after I heard Emily's story. The Hoving Home, which has a campus here in New York, one in New Jersey, one in California, and one in Las Vegas. So you'll hear the stories of three of the women that have come through that program, uh, which is the partner of Unshattered and their journey through addiction, recovery, and now to working for Unshattered. But as I got involved, I started to meet these incredible women who work so hard to achieve sobriety. And yet after they completed 12 months of a residential program, often they maybe didn't have job skills. Some of them didn't have an education, but most importantly, most of them didn't have a safe community to return home to. And so they would go back to where they previously had been with the determination to stay well and stay sober, but the pressures of that environment often proved to be too much. We lost 72,000 Americans in 2019 to an overdose. And that's a shame to me because I think that true recovery is possible, that we can provide pathways for women to get back on their feet and maintain that sobriety. So I left my career at IBM. I started Unshattered in um, 2015 
and we do handbags out of all upcycled materials. So we use discarded items like sets from Broadway shows, retired military uniforms, and more as a metaphor for the women's lives to take something that's discarded and thrown out without purpose, remade into something beautiful, purposeful, and meaningful. So our team is made up of women that are all in recovery. Their jobs are not just show, sewing, but they run basically our entire organization from the back end of our website to running our boutique, uh, to our production manager who is on tonight, to our product design, our creative lead who is on tonight. So they just are thriving. And our model is that we don't just employ them we wrap that employment around a holistic and ongoing personal professional and spiritual development program. So inside of their 40 hour work week, they're getting on the average four hours of paid time for things like therapeutic counseling. Uh, we have members of the community come in and do lunch and learn programs to teach them professional skills. They have mentoring sessions. Uh, two of our women are actually furthering their education. Amanda that you're gonna hear from tonight is pursuing her college degree and Jen is working with our partner the Council of Industry uh, to get a certification in production management. So we are so honored to just be a part of the journey of, the, of these women. We've been doing full-time employment for women in recovery in about four and a half years now, and we've seen 100% of our employees continue to choose sobriety during their time with us. And so our goal, like I said, is really to pave the road and close the gap for women between sobriety and long-term success. So I'll turn it to Amanda to share her story. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Serena, for having us tonight. Um, it's such an honor to be here. Um, so my, uh, I'm originally from Pennsylvania and I had a pretty normal childhood. Um, we didn't have a lot of money growing up um, and I grew up in a trailer park um, and there was some drug and alcohol use, and I think I learned from a very early age that was a coping skill or mechanism. I'm not sure which one, but it, it definitely um, it definitely had an impact on my drug use um, over the next year, over the next following years. Um, so we moved to, into a house when I was in fifth grade, and I moved to a new school, and um, I was tortured the whole time that I went there, I remember coming home crying every day. Um, kids would throw rocks at me at the bus stop. Um, they called me BO girl. It was a nightmare. So the following year, I, I just wanted to fit in and I started smoking cigarettes and drinking and hanging out with the kids who did all that stuff. Um, my drug use progressed throughout high school to harder drugs more often, um, a lot of drinking and partying. And my parents couldn't take it, so they kicked me out of their house um, at the beginning of my senior year. And I moved in with my boyfriend and ended up pregnant with my first daughter by the end of my senior year in high school. Um, so shortly after having her, I was working part-time and going to community college part-time. Um, and I began working at a strip club um, to make extra money. And, you know, all my friends were off of college, and, and that's what I was doing. So... Um, I ended up getting involved in two pretty bad car accidents between 2007 and 2008, where I broke my back. Um, I had several surgeries. Um, I shattered my kneecap and, um, and have metal in my arm. And because of that, I was prescribed a lot of painkillers um, and I got addicted very quickly. Uh, I, it just kind of spiraled out of control. Uh, I started seeing pain management doctor and they, once they cut me off, I ended up buying pills from the street and they're really expensive. Um, I really tried everything to, to stop doing that because I, I didn't want to be addicted. I mean, I was doing things, taking my kids savings bonds and just all sorts of whatever I could do to, to get my next fix, I would do it. So um, I just, I wanted to stop and I went to different rehabs and tried all different things, but I just, I couldn't do it on my own. Um, so I ended up getting pregnant again because I thought that would keep me sober and it didn't. Um, shortly after I had my second daughter in 2010, uh, I began using drinking, uh, taking pills again. And then um, one day I couldn't find pills and an ex-boyfriend of mine um, told me that he had heroin and at first I said, no, I didn't want it. And I couldn't, still couldn't find the pills. So then I ended up um, injecting heroin for the first time. Um, that 
completely, completely spiraled my life out of control. Um, I lost everything. I lost custody of my two daughters, um, which was devastating to me. Um, and that just kind of just made me go running towards the drug even more for comfort. And um, it was the only thing I could find security in at the time. And um, I ended up getting involved in prostitution. Um, I ended up homeless. Um, and there was one point I was living in this rundown motel and I was so skinny and just, I remember looking at myself in the mirror and seeing all the bones in my, like in my collarbone and in my neck and just, I just remember thinking that I'm going to die if I don't do something. Um, so I really just called out for help and I, I got it the next day in the form of getting arrested and going to jail. Um, I didn't see that in the moment, but now that I look back, it really was divine intervention. Um, while I was in jail, two ladies came from the Hoving home that Kelly was talking about, um, and they shared their stories of, of hope and, and how they overcame drug addiction um, and found a new way to live. And so I remember thinking, when I get out of here, if I don't get my crap together, I'm going to go there. And so I didn't get my crap together. Um, things ended up getting much worse. Um, and so then I ended up calling the home at one of my worst points and I did six months in the program and it was not successfully. Um, I left after six months and I knew I wasn't ready to and I relapsed that day and I stayed out for about 10 months where I met my husband who was physically, emotionally, sexually abusive to me. Um, and once again, I felt trapped and I had nowhere to go. And uh, luckily I still had some friends at the home and I called and they told me to come back. So I ended up going into the year program and I completed that in 2018, I believe. And um, life has just been amazing since then. Uh, since completing, I have been employed full-time at Unshattered for almost three years now. Um, I, I, just, I'm so grateful where I'm at. I actually had a son uh, with my husband, but was able to leave the marriage um, for good last year. And so I've been kind of battling through that and just, you know, trying to get my footing. But I think since leaving him, my confidence has soared through the roof. Um, I, I graduated the Leadership Duchess program. Um, I have my own apartment with my son. Uh, we're doing great. Um, I'm enrolled, like Kelly said, at SUNY Empire in their um, business administration program. Um, so I'm pursuing my bachelor's degree in business. In business. And I, I'm just thriving at Unshattered. I mean, I'm the product manager and I love what I do. It, it doesn't even feel like a job. And Kelly was talking about all the benefits that are there and it's just, it amazes me that I get to be part of such a, an incredible organization that cares about our success and about, about women thriving and just giving people another chance to, to really to thrive in life. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't give us another chance and, and to have this shot has been absolutely amazing. So thank you so much for letting me share. And thank you so much, Amanda. She is an incredible employee and it has been delightful to watch her grow and gain confidence, like she said. Um, and I'm gonna ask Jen to go next and share her story. Jen is our uh, production manager. Hi, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I feel really honored to be able to tell you my story and to just get the word out there that there is hope for addiction. Just like you said, Senator, there is hope. And um, my story starts when I was a very young child. I was abused sexually, mentally. Um, and it was, I was so young that I really just did not even know how to cope with that. I started drinking and using drugs when I was 10 years old. And um, that just through high school, through, uh, you know, my early adulthood, was all drugs and alcohol and then I got pregnant and of course I stopped when I was pregnant and it just you know I would stop and I would start and that just took me through a 30-year addiction to drugs and alcohol and that is every kind of drug every just the lowest point of anything you can think of and my rock bottom was um, one night about four years ago when I 
was sitting in the dark in the corner and I just could not do it anymore. And I um, was seriously considering taking my own life. And, um, you know, I was very, very drunk. And because of that, I passed out and I didn't end up killing myself. But I, I just knew something had to change. And that is when I called the Hoving Home and um, I in, went through their program in Las Vegas at, for a year and I found a foundation. I found, they gave me tools to um, just to be successful in recovery. Um, I had no idea how I was gonna do this. Like I said, I was addicted since I was very young. I had no idea how I was gonna live a normal life without drugs. And I just knew that I couldn't live the way that I was living anymore. So, um, you know, I got, I got some good tools. I got some good um, support um, from the community. And um, I started actually working for the Hoving Home. And um, through that, um, I was put in touch with Kelly to come to New York and work at Unshattered. And it, I have to tell you, it's the best decision I ever made. Um, I've been able to, you know, keep my, you know, sustained sobriety, which is super important and, and an economic stability that helps me sustain my sobriety. And now I have my own home, I have my own car, I have a life and a support system that is unbelievable, that um, I am surrounded by people who are very um, committed to their growth and committed to helping me with my growth. So um, yeah, that's my story. And I just thank you again for letting me share. Thank you so much, Jen. Jen, has it's been so fun to watch her grow. I think it was roughly about a year ago, she said, uh, we talked about what was what were we most scared of and Jen's was public speaking. <laughs> and she's been on several big stages since then. So thanks for making her do it again. <laughs> and next to her is Savannah and Savannah is one of our seamstresses and she's also the lead trainer. So when we have new women join our team, Savannah does the training. So Savannah, share your story. Hello again. Thank you. It's such an honor to share my story and hope. Um, so my story begins with, mm, let's see, well, both of my, my, my dad and my mom, um, they're both functioning addicts. Um, so growing up, I was already exposed to that and um, a lot of gang violence as well. Um, at the age of 12 is when I picked up my first marijuana um, and I tried it. I um, just fell. I just fell in it, and um, that was a gateway to meth, coke, pills, cigarettes, alcohol, and um, it became really heavy because I didn't have that attention and love that I desired with my parents. Um, I was always an outcast growing up. Um, people knew me that um, a lot of gang members were always coming in inside the house, you know, the, you know my whole block will be raided with cops because there was just so much drugs and just gang violence activity and um, no one didn't really want to be around me so that kind of like took a toll on me too. It made me feel neglected, isolated and just really like I didn't belong and so my I felt my belonging and my identity with other gang members as well so I took on those steps as well and um, it just went throughout my life in high school. Um, I hardly went to school and I was always bitching. Um, I just couldn't really function. I couldn't really think. I couldn't really just pay attention. So I just gave up. Um, even, but even throughout my life, like I, I didn't want to live like that. I was tired of using. I was crying out for help inside, but didn't know how to ask. Um, I remember doing, um, in high school, there was this drug counselor that would come you know, for, for, you know, just for the students who, you know, would, you know, have that problem. And I signed up, you know, secretly without even nobody like knowing, like even my friends not even knowing. And next thing you know, I go and all of my friends are there, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't even know, like it, but it, 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 even though they were there, like it seemed like it was just a hangout spot, you know, like no one took it serious and I was just really upset because I wanted it like I wanted it so bad and um I just 
didn't have any hope. And so um, after high school, it just really fell really hard. I got more into, more addicted. Um, let's see. Um, and then um, I guess my turning point was when um, I overdosed, you know, and that really scared me. Um, <clears throat> I felt like this was my life. It was either I was going to die or be in jail for the rest of my life. And so, um, um, I heard, okay, I'm sorry. So, um, before that happened, I was in jail and I, I heard, um, I seen this chaplain and she was also a graduate of the Hobie home. So fast forward when I, um, did, um, when I overdosed somehow I got in contact with her. Um, it was just so crazy. Like after that overdose, like a couple of days later, I bumped into her. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, I, I, you know, like, I can't believe I, 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 I'm seeing you right now. Like, you know, I, I just cried out to her, I told her I need help. And she referred me to the homie home. And um, I was scared, you know, because it, it was just scary, you know, um, wanting help, but at the same time, like not knowing the unknown. So um, I called, I did an intake, um, I got accepted. And, you know, that was the best decision I ever made, you know, ever since then, like, I don't, I'm not looking back and, you know, being sober it feels so good now like you know to the point where I'm even giving you know my friends hope that are still out there you know they look up to me you know even my sister who me and her used to get high together she also found sobriety you know she went through a program as well but a different program and you know just seeing how like I'm being impacted and affected through those around me is just so amazing and so um, I did the program I completed it. I worked for them. And then um, the same like Jen, I, I heard of um, Unshattered and, you know, I, um, I tried it, you know, and next thing you know, I felt like it was a hidden skill in me that, you know, I discovered, you know, um, and I just been growing there and thriving there, like to the point where I started learning. Next thing you know, like I'm starting to cheat, teach other women you know, um, I'm a staff trainer. So any new women coming in, I do a one-on-one -on -one personal training with them, you know, just encouraging them, letting them know, letting them know you know, um, it's, it's possible <laughs> to, you know, learn how to sew. And um, even on Shatter, just, it's just amazing to work at a place where, you know, you can just learn about yourself. You know, every week we have like a lunch and learn. You know, there's always great subjects that I get personally, and it's just amazing all in all. So that's my story. <laughs> Thank you so much, Savannah. When Savannah first came to us, she wasn't sure if she was good at anything, but I'll tell you that we haven't found anything yet that she's not good at. <laughs> Every time we raise the bar, she steps up. So it's been so fun to see her really succeed. So, um, you know, we use the terminology for our women that they are ambassadors of possibility, that they're showing the world what is truly possible, that not only can you recover and get to sobriety, but that you can thrive and you can gain an education and you can influence people and you can have a good impact on your community. In fact, when COVID hit this spring, uh, we of course were non-essential. So we had to shut down our production on handbags. Um, I had a death in the family. So I was out of the office and this team, women in recovery on their own, transitioned our business, completely changed our manufacturing, partnered with Vassar Brothers Medical Center, designed a mask that we could make available to the caregivers in our community. And so over three and a half months, the team led production to make and donate 9,000 masks here to our local community. Wow. Of course, that was a business model shift for us. And so instead of what is typically uh, the source of funding for all of the salaries and benefits for our women in recovery, which is product sales, we had to go completely to a donation model. Generally, that's only 30% of our operating budget. So this community has been so amazing investing in these women and making this possible. And we're so, so grateful for all of you. Um, part of my desire is that not only do we showcase these stories of women um, and, and spread hope for people that are currently struggling with addiction, but that we change the minds of people like me who used to be judgmental and used to think, why don't you just get your act together and be more responsible? 
uh, we had the privilege of meeting with the Surgeon General early last year, and he said that people that are in recovery uh, are the most valuable employees because the community and the rhythm of work is so important to them that they hardly miss a day, that they invest in their jobs. And I'll tell you, I have never worked with a more talented team that is better at solving problems, that is more committed to their work, that is more creative, uh, and is has, puts more of their heart into their job than this group of women. So thank you again, Senator Serino, for the chance to share this platform, share our story, and I would be remiss if I didn't say that you could find us at unshattered.org and on social media at Unshattered NY. So thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Kelly. And you know, Amanda, I haven't seen you in a couple of years and you look fabulous. Thank you again. I'm always like, when you tell your story, it's so heartwarming and I'm just so glad to see you doing so wonderful. Very happy for you. You were pregnant, I think the last time yes, <laughs> that I, I saw you. Thank you yep. so much. Seth. Yeah, thank you look so you, opportunity. you look great. Thanks. And um, Jen and Savannah, thank you for telling us your stories too. Oh my gosh, and I'm so glad that you're all a part of Unshattered because I've been impressed with Kelly from day one. And I loved hearing what you just said too, Kelly. You know, like, because when you think about the uh, workforce that you came from, right? And here you are talking about these women that are such great workers and so dedicated and care about what they do. Uh, just really is amazing and just touches my heart. So thank you. And now the next person that I'm gonna introduce is Kristen McConnell, a friend of mine who I've known for I think six years now uh, from the Putnam County Prevention Council, another person who cares so much about our community. She's a real dynamo. Uh, so Kristen, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you and thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, thank you for hosting tonight. And I know you said it earlier, you're truly an advocate for um, people struggling with mental health and substance use disorder. So for bringing this to light during this time, I just really appreciate it. So important. So hopefully people will get, you know, take away what they need from this and hopefully people will watch this um, and just, and, and hopefully we can be of help uh, for the community. So. I, at that, I'm going to uh, share my screen. I have a few slides just in case there's stuff that I mentioned. The resources will be on the screen. People can take a screenshot. Uh, here we go. And hang on one second. Okay, great. So as the Senator mentioned, I'm Kristen McConnell from the Prevention Council of Putnam. We're a New York State Office of Alcohol and Substance Abuse Services. Uh, a pro um, certified prevention provider, which basically means that um, we get some state, state um, aid to uh, provide prevention services to um, the community. So one of the really important things that we do uh, is provide information and referral, um, which is confidential, and we do that by phone or in person or um, online through our social media um, private messaging or through our website. So. Um, our website has a wealth of information for all types of uh, behavioral health services, um, but I just wanted to point out that uh, one of the things that we do is sponsor the Friends of Recovery Putnam, which I believe there's also one in Duchess, and there are grassroots organizations that um, support people that are in recovery or their families and friends, so it's just another way um, that you can become involved in the community if you're interested. Uh, and then we also do a variety of community-based prevention services that I won't really get into, but a lot of education, information, doing things like this. So, um, but what's really important to know is what resources are available in our community. So we have Arms Acres, um, which um, is the detox uh, facility in Putnam. They provide um, inpatient and outpatient treatment services and they also have uh, medication assisted treatment or MAT which is really important that's an evidence-based practice for people struggling um, with an opioid addiction so and they also are one of the opioid overdose prevention programs which means that they are able to provide uh, Narcan training so we've been partnering with them for a number of years now along with drug crisis in our backyard to host those trainings and um, obviously with the pandemic, we haven't been able to do those in a traditional format, but we are hosting uh, regional uh, Narcan trainings monthly 
with our partners at the National Guard, and there's actually one happening tonight, but I also see there's one happening um, tonight on this uh, program as well, which is great. Um, and uh, Cove Care Center, they um, are another OASIS a provider and they are a mental health and addiction treatment provider, which means they have uh, the ability to provide both mental health and or treatment services um, under one roof. They also have uh, medication assisted treatment um, and they have a great family navigation program that I wanted to point out, which really is a way um, to connect uh, with their family navigator and have them help really do what exactly that is, navigate the, the family to get the treatment that they need. Um, then we also have St. Christopher's Inn, which is a men's program for 18 and over, and they provide, again, medication-assisted treatment as well as addiction, uh, you know, substance use disorder treatment, and they um, are a shelter at night, so they're not an inpatient facility, but there is a shelter there. Um, and they are another opioid overdose prevention program, and I know that they provide a lot of um, services, um, especially on the western side of our county. And finally, the Walter Hoving Home, which was actually mentioned, obviously, uh, just a few moments ago, which is a residential faith-based nonprofit organization that serves women 18 and over who are um, dealing with substance use disorder. So I've included um, all of the websites on the screen, and you can also get this information from our website, which is preventioncouncilputnam.org. Um, I also just wanted to mention a program that Putnam is a part of, Hope Not Handcuffs. Um, this is a national program that began in Michigan and it's now in the Hudson Valley. So we uh, launched this program just about a year ago with our three police departments. You may have heard of this, but it's basically a partnership with local law enforcement and community organizations. So someone can walk into any of our police departments at any point and ask for help and um, the facility, uh, the law enforcement facility will respond and they'll contact our angel coordinators in Putnam who will then reach out to the angels. I'm actually a trained angel volunteer. So um, through an application, we're contacted and respond really to um, help that person um, get the treatment. And it's been, the success rate has been wonderful. We've not been able to, there's never been a person that has not been placed. So um, I'm just wanted to mention that as another way that people can get help. Um, just along the lines of Narcan, uh, one of the things that we're doing now, like I said, is virtual, but also just for people that prefer the in-person, we are for the first time doing a pop-up training next week. Um, we're hoping for good weather because it'll be outside. We're doing it as a mask distribution um, event along with um, drug deterra active activation bags, which is a way to dispose of your um, prescription medications. And I just wanted to include that here so you all are aware. And it is, um, we're partnering with National Guard and um, we have a bilingual trainer there as well. So we'll be able to provide the, um, the brief Narcan training both in English and Spanish. And I also just wanted to include some of the state um, and national resources that I have found very helpful. Um, there is a hope line that's 24 seven that um, the Office of Addiction and services and support um, sponsors, and um, I've actually used it myself when making referrals, and they're extremely helpful. Um, there's also a dashboard, which is another very useful tool for anybody. Um, you don't have to be working in this field. You can just go on the dashboard, find addictiontreatmentny.gov, and you can put in the geography, geographic area you're in, what kind of treatment you're looking for, and it gives you live updates of what is available within that catchment area. Um, I also just wanted to include the Healing Community Study, which is a initiative through the National Institute um, of uh, Drug Addiction, and that is uh, something that Putnam County is currently a part of, and it's focusing on opioids and um, increasing Narcan training and medication for use disorder and focusing also on responsible prescribing practices, and we are a part of that movement. Um, and finally, there's also a National Treatment Locator Hotline uh, through SAMHSA, which um, is also helpful. So I just felt like, you know, Sometimes you might want to call or get information and it's maybe on the weekend and you, you know, these are other ways that you can 24-7 uh, get this information. 
And finally, I just want to end just by saying that sort of what was said earlier by the women that shared their stories that, you know, I like to say that uh, prevention works, treatment is available, and recovery is possible. And as we saw from the women and heard from the women earlier, that they are case in point that that is true. And there are so many resources and people that are, that are here to help. So whichever way you get it, um, whether it's tonight, whether it's calling one of us, um, just please reach out because like I said, we're here to help. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and thank you again for having me. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, that was a great PowerPoint and great uh, helpful information for people that are watching. And like I said, it'll be recorded. So a lot of people will be able to see that after this. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Jean Marie uh, Nyber from Dutchess County Department of Community and Behavioral Health. And Jean Marie is another great friend and partner. And I can't thank you enough for being here tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Jean Marie. All right, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. And thank you to everyone who's come before me, uh, especially the women from Unshattered who shared their truly inspirational stories. Um, every time I hear stories of people in recovery, I'm blown away. Um, you know, I'm a clinician by training. So in my line of work, I get to see a lot of people who um, have gone through a lot of things. And it, it just, it's every time I hear another story, it's just, you know, it, it's really, uh, fruit for the soul, keeps us going. So I'm gonna just share a little bit with you tonight about um, the services available in Dutchess County. And just to piggyback a little bit on what Kristen was saying, we do have some of the same resources in Dutchess County that they have in Putnam. Um, we are neighbors and so we do share some resources, which is really nice because a regional approach really enhances access to care. Um, we use Arms Acres a lot in Dutchess County as well, so just wanted to mention that. Um, and we also have recently in Dutchess County started to um, increase the Hope Not Handcuffs program in some of our local police jurisdictions, which is really turning out to be a very fruitful collaboration with our law enforcement. Um, so we are seeing that they just started in Beacon and they also have it going in Wappingers Falls. Um, and, and we'd really love to see that expand. So um, just now circle back and start talking about some of the things that are unique to Dutchess County. Um, so in Dutchess County, we have uh, some services that are available through our department that are 24-7, um, 365, meaning these services are available to the entire community every single day of the year. Uh, the first one I wanted to talk about is the Dutchess County Helpline. And the Helpline um, is uh, staffed by mental health and substance use professionals. It's available 24 hours a day, all year. And that uh, phone number is 485-9700. You can call that number or text that number and it will put you in touch with a mental health professional immediately. Um, and that person, that helpline really is the portal to other services. So you can call there and say, you know, I'm ready, I'm, I'm ready to go to treatment, or I'm in a crisis. You could call and say, I'm standing on the bridge and I just don't know what to do. And the people on that line will be able to talk you through whatever it is that you're going through or connect you to services. So in Dutchess County, we have two major um, public providers that contract with the county to provide services. Uh, Family Services provides mental health, public mental health services, and they have several clinics throughout the county, five clinics throughout the county. Um, and then we have the Lexington Center for Recovery, which provides services uh, for uh, recovery, including medication-assisted treatment. There's many other uh, providers within Dutchess County. I won't go into all of them, but you can access any of that information by calling or texting the helpline. There's also an app that you can download on your phone uh, for helpline. The next service I was going to speak about tonight is the Stabilization Center. And the Stabilization Center is located at 230 North Road in Poughkeepsie, which for those of you who are familiar with Poughkeepsie, it's right across the street from uh, what used to be St. Francis Hospital and is now Mid-Hudson Regional Hospital. And this is a walk-in center for mental health or substance use uh, crisis. So anyone in Dutchess County can walk into this center 24 hours a day, all year long, 
um, and gain access to a mental health or substance use professional. You can also uh, get immediate care there. So, <clears throat> and, and you, do, you, you can enter the stabilization center if you are under the influence. Um, so if you are in a substance use crisis and you're looking for help and you are under the influence, that is okay. You can stay at the center for up to 24 hours. So 23 hours and 59 minutes to be exact. Um, and people there can help you connect with services. Uh, they can drive you to a treatment center. They can um, get you set up in, in, whatever, in whatever aspect of recovery you're, you are ready for. Um, people at the stabilization center can also, also help with harm reduction education. So if you are a person who uses substances and you are not yet ready to enter into formal treatment and you are still using substances, the staff at the Stabilization Center want to be able to help you to be as safe as possible. And so that includes Narcan training and it also includes um, uh, fentanyl test strips because we know that um, especially in uh, the Northeast states, we have a major fentanyl problem and it's really killing people uh, in, in terrible, terrible numbers. Um, so we want to make people who are still using drugs as safe as possible. We want to make sure that people stay alive so that um, we can get them the help that they need. Um, the, the last, well, a couple more things. So mobile crisis team is a, a team of mental health professionals that can actually go out into the community. Uh, and that is accessed through the Dutchess County Helpline. So if you are, you or someone you know is in crisis and you're out in the community and you need assistance, you can call the helpline and say, I need the mobile crisis team. And they'll talk to you about that and they'll see if the mobile crisis team is appropriate. And if it is, they'll, they'll deploy the mobile crisis team to your location. Um, so that's a very helpful service. Uh, then just one other thing to mention is that the Department of Behavioral and Community Health um, partners with the criminal justice system to really work on criminal justice reform within our community. So uh, we have uh, the BEAT patrol, which is uh, mental health clinicians doing ride-alongs with our police officers. We do crisis intervention team training with uh, law enforcement in um, Dutchess County. Uh, and we have uh, treatment programs within the Dutchess County Jail and outside of a Dutchess County Jail for people who are incarcerated or who have chosen an alternative to incarceration treatment program. Uh, and so those are all um, very effective programs. We're also happy to be able to offer medication assisted treatment in the jail now, which is uh, a proven practice to help save lives. Um, and we are an opioid overdose prevention program. So we are able to uh, do lots of trainings and uh, disseminate Narcan to the community. And I think that's pretty much all I was going to share for tonight. Again, thank you so much, and thanks for listening to me. And if you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, you can call us. You can call me. I will put uh, the helpline number and also my number uh, in the chat box for everybody to access. Thank you so much, Jean Marie. You know, the Stabilization Center, uh, I believe we are the first one in the state, you know, our county executive, uh, worked with everybody uh, to have this come uh, to be. And I remember years ago, you know, a lot of people know my story about losing my brother to suicide. And I remember there wasn't really a safe place or a welcoming place for him to go. And I have to tell you, I love the Stabilization Center. It's a great resource and I can't thank you enough for the work that you do. And thank you for mentioning Hope Not Handcuffs. I'd like to see that um, throughout all of our uh, law enforcement and throughout the state great, great program. Uh, so now I think we're going to turn it over to some questions. And if you'd, if you'd like to ask a question, just type it into the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. And I know that we have some to start off with. Um, so the first one is what role, and this is for um, Amanda, Jen, and Savannah, uh, it's what role has Unshattered played in your recovery and how has employment impacted your recovery? Um, so having somewhere to go after the program that I went through was really instrumental in, in sustained sobriety. Um, I think Kelly mentioned that going back um, to the area that you're from, I mean, for me, I can only speak for myself, but 
it always uh, tripped me up when I would go back to Pennsylvania and try to and try to live there again. All the people that I used with were there, and so just having um, so having a next step after I completed the program, I went through the apprenticeship, and then um, I was able to get my own place, so that way I could stay in the area and and continue to work for Unshattered. So it's been huge. Um, and just, I mean, being able to work with other women who are in recovery on a daily basis, I think that's a big part of it too. That's great. Thank you, Amanda. And Jen or Savannah, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, just exactly what Amanda said. Uh, you know, we work so hard to, to get our sobriety and to sustain it. And um, it's just, instead of going home, it's the option that we chose and it, and it works. Um, yeah. Same thing as Amanda said, she hit it right on the nail. Great. And well, Savannah, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, I agree. Just same thing, I agree. That's good. And this next question is a really good question too. It says, what, they've asked, what services do you think our community needs to support women in recovery? It's a great question. Um, I believe that we need more businesses that hire recover people in recovery. Um, you know, just like Kelly was saying, so many people cannot go back to where they come from. And, um, and when that's your only option, you're setting yourself up for failure. And I think that if we had more businesses that would hire people out of recovery, at least for a trial period, so they so we can prove ourselves that we are trustworthy and we do want to work hard for our new life and um you know i i think it's a, a worthwhile investment for sure that's that's a great point savannah or amanda did you want to add anything um i agree with jen i know for me um even before getting help you know um i have a record you know so even, you know, me having a background record, trying to get a job, you know, it's really hard, you know, and just, I, I totally agree, just, you know, businesses being open-minded, no matter where you came from or what, you know, just not to hold your past against yeah, you. Yeah, not to hold your past against you. Thank you. And Amanda, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say housing. I think housing options are huge. It's, it's not always easy when you're first coming out of a program to, um, to be able to afford, especially around here, um, to be able to live on your own. I mean, I lived with a roommate for the first couple of years, um, and I was really, really blessed to have um, some people who were close to the program um, that were able to give us affordable housing. So. Uh, I think more housing programs would definitely be helpful for people who are who are really trying to do better and, and to move on with their lives. Thank you. Those are all great points. Um, and there's uh, here's another question. What are some of the strengths you find in your coworkers at Unshattered and how do they excuse me, how do they support you in recovery in your recovery? Uh, the biggest strength I see in my coworkers is resilience. Um, we, for whatever reason, maybe because we've been through what we've been through, we are able to get through stuff. And I know that we are better together. We um, rally around each other and it's just, um, yeah, resilience. That's good. Anybody else want to add something? Yeah, I'd like to add the community that we have. Um, even on our worst days, uh, we, we lift each other up and, you know, we don't, we don't let each other stay down. So I think we do a really good job of just encouraging one another, you know. That's, you know, that's great to have that, you know, partnership, right? You know, you can rely on each other. I love that. Um, then another question is, are, what are some of the barriers to recovery? that you've found that might be helpful to talk about for people. I mean, I feel like this time, well, I can speak uh, from before. If you're not ready, you're not gonna do it. <laughs> I mean, and, and as sad as it is to say, if somebody wants it for you, it's not gonna help. I mean, 
my parents wanted it for me for a long time. Every other time I attempted treatment, it was to appease somebody else or to pull the wool over people's eyes because I still wanted to do what I wanted to do. And it wasn't until I genuinely wanted to change that I actually did. And Jen or, or Savannah, did you have Yeah, any? I agree. I agree. That's true. It's, it's something you've got to want for yourself. I mean, of course, uh, you know, there's, there's always parents and there's always family who want to see you succeed. And, you know, a lot of times we'll go to recovery for them and it's just, it has to be something that you want. And, and it's sad to say, but most of the time, I mean, speaking for myself, if I wouldn't have hit that rock bottom, I, I wouldn't have wanted it like I did. And you know, that's just, that's the, just the truth of my life. What about you, Savannah? The same thing, you know, I, it's sad to say that I had to like face death in order for me to like wake up and realize where I was headed and yeah. I would add to that too. I think, you know, there's certainly barriers to recovery in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. But the problem that I was witnessing is just the relapse cycle. Yeah. That even when we can get somebody into recovery, odds are it's not going to stick. And so it just, it's inefficient and it creates a lot of hopelessness when we can't provide a pathway for people after they've already made the decision and after we've gotten the barriers out of the way and after we've given them the opportunity to achieve sobriety, if we don't close the gap on, for us, it's purpose, doing something meaningful. Mm -hmm. It is a community of like-minded people that understand the struggles and it's economic stability that gives them choices about where they're going to live and how they get from place to place. So those three elements, I think, have proven to be really critical that, you know, even I look at this pandemic that we've had, keeping our team employed was the most important thing to me because I know that when they have purpose, community, and economic stability, they can withstand an awful lot of external pressure. Yeah, that is so true, Kelly. Um, and I don't know if anybody, I don't know, let's see. And then we'll go into the knocking. Okay, good. Well, I just want to say that to Amanda. Um, like I said, it's always great to see you and hear your story. Again, I'm uh, just so glad that you're doing so well. And Jen and Savannah, thank you for participating and telling your stories too. I mean, this really gives people that hope that I think that they need, especially after this time that we've gone through, you know, with COVID. I think about how people were isolated. And I know, um, and Jean Marie, you could probably appreciate this too, people with mental health issues um, we, or people with PTSD, we don't want them to be isolated, right? But here now, because of COVID, they have to be isolated. So it opens up a whole other area of issues. And, uh, you know, Kelly, that's what was so great that you were able to keep the girls working. And uh, I think that was great. You have that stability, right? You need stability. So I can't thank you enough. And um, I just want to say thank you to Kelly. Thank you to Kristen, Jean Marie, Amanda, Jen, and Savannah. You know, I just uh, think our message tonight too is that the thing to take away here today is that no one should have to suffer in silence. And there's always help in our community. Look at all the resources that everybody spoke about tonight. And that's why I'm so glad that this is recorded and that people will be able to watch this and know that there is hope, especially when they hear your stories uh, and that they'll have the resources that they truly, truly need. And if anybody needs help at all, they can always reach out to me at our office. Um, we're, we can always get them involved with any of the resources, many resources that are out there. So I uh, thank you all.